so that we can post this later. Uh, just as a reminder, you're all going to be muted. If you have questions, please use the chat and we will answer those as, as we're able to uh, through the presentation. Um, and then hopefully at the end, we'll have some time for question and answer. Uh, if we do at that point, you can unmute yourself and feel free to ask. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Dawson. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It is great to see you. Uh, it's already May. Uh, the school year has oh, gone by oh. very, very quickly. Um, I want to um, focus largely on getting some EMP feedback from you all, uh, but do want to make a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the first is that in the fall of 2022, so when we return for the next academic year, we're, we are going to hold a fire drill as an institution, the safety committee has um, set this as a goal of ours to get back in the practice of having both having good safety plans and practicing them. Uh, so this is just the first time that I'm saying, hey, we're headed in that direction. We've got some work to do to solidify things. I do wanna share with you, we intend to tell you what day and what time that drill is happening and do a lot of communicating. It won't be a surprise because while we wanna practice, we also, want to make sure that we are uh, getting good feedback about what we need to do to improve. So fall of 2022, we're going to have a fire drill. Also want to make sure everybody has on their calendars that on Friday at three o'clock at Olive Hill, we are going to hold our employee award ceremony. Um, it has been a number of years since our institution has been able to do this. In fact, it will be the first time that I have an opportunity to do it in person. We'll recognize our retirees. We'll do a quick recognition of our tenure uh, those who are awarded tenure this year, uh, we will recognize our faculty full-time and part-time excellence awards, our CSEA professional excellence award as well, and the Yuba Spirit Award. So I'm hopeful you'll be, and, and our anniversaries as well. So work anniversaries as I call them, but uh, so please be sure that's on your calendar to join us. I also want to let you know that currently invitations have not yet gone out to the candidates, but we are aiming to have final round interviews for the vice president of instruction on May 18th and 20th. And I also want to tell you that's going to look a little bit different than maybe what we've done in the past. So the vice president of instruction finalists will have a one hour interview with those individuals who report directly to the vice president of inst instruction, in addition to the typical final interview that they would have, we will also have college-wide open forums for those candidates. So we're trying to work out some logistics uh, to make that happen. The uh, screening committee did an amazing job and put a little pressure on me to do it uh, quickly. And so I'm trying to do everything that I can to make that possible. So again, there haven't been invites that have gone out to the finalists, but I wanted to let you all know so you could look for ways to be flexible, if at all possible. Uh, looking forward to moving that process forward. So with that, I'm going to jump into the education master plan. So our education master plan is something that is a requirement for our institution to do. It's typically on a three-year cycle. We are behind a little over a year, and the reason we're behind is that the district had asked us to hold off on doing that so we could align ourselves with the district's strategic plan. What you see here is kind of a, the short version of a list of things that we did to get to this point today. So we started by uh, hiring a contractor to assist us with some of that work, make sure that they were guiding us in the right direction. We did uh, presentations through college council. We agreed on a process with academic senate. Uh, we then moved into the sort of the kickoff stage uh, we submitted a series of data points to Moss, which is our contractor, and I'm going to show you uh, literally, there's a slide that you'll get to see. Uh, we talked about it at the November U-Zoom. We made sure that everybody understood that there was a steering committee that represented the big constituent groups in our participative, participative governance, as well as our operational side. Those individuals were responsible since we started meeting in December and having consistent conversations with their constituency about progress being made. We did a lot of meetings where we talked about some of the data that our contractors were able to 
get from us internally and then present so that we could take a look at what was happening with our institution. We've been doing that again since December. We had a series of focus groups that were held in February and into early March. And then there were a series of meetings with the steering committee that resulted in a draft document. We're gonna talk about that document today. That document, which we're gonna go through is focused on some high level outcomes. This is what we are committing to as an institution. So this is the point where we are um, getting a recommendation through participative governance that in the next three years, these are the things we need to commit to do as an institution uh, to make us a better Yuba. We sent out an outcome survey college-wide and that survey closed yesterday. I provided the results Thanks to Cassie Leal. First of all, she did that in less than a day. But I, um, I provided the results of that survey to the College Council Tri Chairs so that they can take a look at that as they consider the outcomes. We're having some feedback today that will also be drafted up and considered as a part of that as well. Um, there's going to be some feedback then, and the College Council will make a recommendation. So, next slide. Um, I wanted you to get a, an idea of the amount of data points that were requested by Moss and what we provided to them. So we're gonna send the presentation out if you wanna read through all of this, but this is page one of the list of data requests that we provided to them. It's everything from uh, enrollment data that's uh, disaggregated by different demographics. Um, it's also some of our plans. Um, at, you know, everything from marketing to strong workforce. Um, it talks, it, we provided them with copies of things like our organizational chart and our current participative governance structure, which is of course under review. Next slide, Jeremy. All right, and I'm, I must have been missing a slide because I think there is a second page of it. That's all right. So moving into the outcomes, and I am being swift on purpose because I want to give us some time on this. So we did send out a um, college-wide survey about the outcomes. The intention of this document is to be the high-level things we know we need to accomplish that we are committing to as an institution. Not posted today, not yet out there and available is uh, a broader, larger document that we're working on that's the tactical, how we're going to do it, who's responsible for it, in what order is it going to happen. That document, as we are going to work on it throughout the summer, is really a living document. It's not intended to be a final, this is exactly what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. Because as we move through projects like this, we know and we look at some of our uh, big initiatives that we've done as an institution, sometimes those things need to fluctuate. What we don't want to fluctuate is our commitment to these specific outcomes. And I wanted, I broke this up into slides and I wanted to take some time today to get some feedback from you all on the outcomes that are presented in here. The first two slides are focused on student success metrics. So students' ability to access our institution, students' ability to persist, retain at our institution, their ability to complete, their ability to find careers and to transfer. So those, these first slides are focused on things that we need to do to help students um, do those, find those success metrics uh, more equitably and certainly more students and more quickly if at all possible. So I wanna start by opening the floor to any thoughts or feedback you might have on the access and persistence and retention outcomes that are drafted here. Denise, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, I was looking at the uh, number three under access, simplify improvements in website redesign. Uh, it is critical. A lot of students I've heard from say that it's hard to get enrolled for the first time at Yuba. I even had challenges getting enrolled in a non-credit class. And so I think simplifying that and having a phone number that someone can call that is on our website 
in case they need help, because I really think that this is critical to getting students enrolled at UBA. Thank you. Any other thoughts or feedback on this one? All right, let's go to the next slide. So these are the completion and career outcomes. I'll give you a minute to read it and then ask if you have any feedback. Any thoughts or feedback from the group? All right, well, We'll skip to the next slide. This one's going to focus on transfer. Miss President. Yes, sir. Hi, how are you? Hi, everyone. Hi, Farouk. Hi, Miss President. Do you mind going back to the first slide? I'm sorry. I. I'm a little bit slow, just catching up today. You're okay. Jeremy, can you go back too? Thanks. Miss <clears throat> um, President, just the, the one thing I want to uh, run by the group, and I've mentioned this in a lot of, so a lot of you have probably heard me say this, but I think, Miss President, it is so important for students to get time with us, just time in general, time that they can't ever get back. And I think that time piece really helps to build that connection that they need to eventually succeed. So I'd like to see, I like to propose, and I know there's budgetary issues. I know there's a lot of constraints that we have, but I think, Ms. President, that the first time a new college student comes to Yuba College, I think they should get a full hour with the counselor to really accomplish three things. One is for them to connect with the counselor. Two, for the counselor to really be able to get to know that student. And then the third piece is, okay, the academics, here's the ed plan, here's the career stuff. I think it takes several different things for a student to be successful. It's not just enough to know what they're doing, where they're going, but it's enough for them to really get to know the counselor and other staff, faculty, you know, across the board. Um, then, Ms. President, moving forward, I think that once a student has that, then later on, potentially, they can make the choice of wanting either a half hour appointment with the counselor or an hour, because students are very savvy, Ms. President. They know what they need, right? They know if they need a half hour, it's an ed plan adjustment. But if they have a lot of issues, like they're changing majors, that might be an hour so you can talk to them and then, you know, do the ed plan. So that's really what I wanted to run by that, Ms. President. I've been wanting to tell you this for a while, and maybe this is just meant to be that I get the chance. I appreciate the time, everyone. Thank you, Faru. I think one of the um, items on here is about is about looking at the onboarding process, and we certainly talked about that a lot last week um, when we attended the Guided Pathways Institute. We'll have time with um, outcomes like this to focus on sort of unpacking what is the best way to onboard students and get them set up for success. So thank you very much.
All right, any feedback on the transfer slide? I, I have something on that. Um, sure. Are we going to make sure that in order to do this in the right way that we have some of this, I guess, staffed and um, open for students to be able to contact someone who can help them with this path? I think we are going to have a conversation about what's the right way to help students um, in, in a transfer center um, for transfer seeking students. I had a chance to meet for a while with, um, with Lisette at Woodland and, uh, and talk a little bit about how, the work that they are doing and some of the innovative ways that they're partnering. And I, I think there are a lot of opportunities out there for us to do that. Um, it's not a commitment to specifically to certain specific tactics. It's about making sure that we um, recognize that it's important for us to do a better job at supporting transfer students and having those conversations. And so for us to do a better job, we, we also might need some people dedicated specifically to that. We, we certainly will have that conversation. Thank you. Energy. Um, I actually wanted to comment on the slide before this about the CTE. Mm -hmm. um, just working with uh, high schools, I've noticed that they're having more robust, more uh, CTE pathways, and they're really looking to have those pathways feed into our college. And unfortunately, as an institution, we haven't really grown our CTE programs. Uh, you know, when we lose full-timers, we don't replace them and we have part-timers trying to maintain these programs. And so I think we do lose out a lot of students. Um, not all students are looking to transfer. So we have, uh, we have students that are CTE oriented. We have students that are transfer oriented. So I think we have enough where we could fill all of those areas. And so I, I just really, some of the programs you see at the high schools, it just like blows you away. But then they're looking for our programs to be a step above so that their students can feed in. And so I think that's something that's really important. Um, I know the high schools are focusing so much on CTE now. There's, you know, just innovation, you know, there's professional development for their teachers, things like that. And I don't, I don't know if our faculty get to do that as much, <laughs> just with everything else. You know, everybody always has a lot on their plates, but um, I think that is something to really to look at because just working with high school students, you hear of a lot more students that are looking for pathways that are gonna lead them to um, good paying careers, but not always is all, are all of the students looking for transfer. So I think we have, a niche in both of those areas. And I, I think those are very important areas. And especially with our community, um, I, I think with the, the low amount of students who do have our you know, folks in the community that do have a bachelor's degree, I think we may have more of an adult population that we could really fill up our CTE programs if we did more outreach, you know, more marketing with our programs. We tend not to, and it kind of falls on the instructors and they usually don't have a lot of time to do that. Um, and, uh, and the community a lot of times does not know what we have to offer. So I think that's really important. Thank you. All right, let's go to the next slide, if you don't mind, Jeremy. All right, so um, the next set of outcomes uh, or objectives that we are focused on is, um, is trying to make sure that as an institution, we are uh, making efforts to, rec to certainly uh, recover from COVID. What are the things we need to do to make sure that we are going to be um, financially sustainable? Um, largely focused on things like enrollment growth. And so on this page, you'll see 
um, you know, talking specifically about enrollment uh, areas of focus based off of the data that was reviewed that was both internal data for our institution and external data for the community that we serve. So they uh, reviewed a lot of the census data um, and uh, took a look at our population, things like educational attainment rates, et cetera. And I think um, to one of the two great points that Energy just made, um, she talked about the adult population. And actually that's one of the items that is included here is looking at uh, pursuing students um, over the age of 25. So I'll pause there and ask if you have any uh, feedback. I know that a lot of our uh, ECE students um, are a uh, population. Um, they have children, they come back to school, they decide to work with children. And um, they usually are part-time students because they usually have children and they are working full-time or part-time. And so, um, Sometimes our students get discouraged because they feel like they're, they have to be full time. So I think also looking at students who intentionally want to be part time students for this age group um, is important. So just wanted to throw that out there. I don't want to go too far down that path, but Denise, I'd love to talk with you a little bit about some of the conversation at the Guided Pathways Institute about that. Maybe you and I can connect sometime if you have time on your superstar yeah. calendar. Well, I know you. I will, I will make time. So yeah, you're still, you're still signing autographs from the play. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the next slide, Jeremy. So I wanna just, I wanna point out two um, key items that are on here because I don't wanna look past them. The first is we know as an institution, you've heard it a lot since I got here that we've gotta do some work on our facilities. We're making great progress, certainly on the outside. We have a really good plan that's in motion for a lot of the insides, uh, not just the building 800, you know, full remodel, but also the classroom and instruct, instructional area remodels that are happening here very soon. Um, that work needs to continue because we have got a lot more work to do. Um, the other is uh, taking retaking a look at the Sutter Center. Um, when the Sutter Center was initially opened, there was a plan and a, you know, a staffing plan and an expectation for what was going to happen there. Um, the world has changed a great deal since it was opened in 2012. And uh, we are, we have certainly strayed from that strategy. Um, and the idea here is to have a conversation about the future of Sutter Center and how it will be used. Um, you know, if you look at just the centers that are within the Yuba Community College District, they're all used in very different ways. Sutter certainly is unique. Um, and this is about really sitting down and outlining a plan that says this is, um, this is what we intend for Sutter to be used uh, for, who we intend to serve through that facility, how we're going to staff it and support it, et cetera. So um, those are kind of they're key items that are, you know, a, a one-liner ish on here, uh, but they're important. I just wanted to mention them. Georgie. Hi. Um, the Sutter Center, I <clears throat> I know that there are plans for it, but I also understand that there may be plans for based on DC3. Um, that there may be plans for us to utilize, sorry, the district to utilize that campus. So I wanna make sure that we're going to be using that. I'm not sure if it will be just for online or if there's something else in the works here and DC3 might have a different idea about it or rather the district. 
for this. Yeah. For yeah. No, no, that's a great point, Georgie. Um, I've been uh, very transparent about uh, the conversation for over a year now that the district was discussing the potential of moving their offices into the Sutter Center. And that is certainly moving, it is certainly moving forward. Um, we have had conversations from the beginning about uh, wanting to avoid them um, taking over classrooms and um, instructional spaces where wherever possible. There's a lot of work to do. Um, we are moving in that direction. It is a priority uh, for the district to transition out of this space that I'm actually sitting in right now and back onto the existing college campuses with Sutter Center being the kind of the key location that that will happen at. And there is a lot of work to do there. It certainly needs to be taken into account, but I don't think we can lose sight of what was the original intent of Sutter Center, which was to, you know, serve you know, through classes uh, to provide educational opportunities out there. And I don't think the district moving in is gonna preclude that. It might have to look different, certainly, um, but but it is a great point. We wanna keep both in mind. And I wanna know, are they gonna pay us? <laughs> <laughs> it's It's been mentioned. <laughs> Anyone else? Hi, uh, Dr. Dotson. I, I think I would like just to uh, express appreciation for the last one, the IT infrastructure issue. Um, the the 1,000 building, I think it's true of the 800 building as well. We're just told they're Faraday cages and that they're not, we can't do uh, internet connectivity in there. And that is a huge problem with the limited number of computer labs and ability to schedule those computer labs. They need to figure out a solution. My understanding is that it's a, a solution that requires money rather than it's impossible. Um, but anyway, I'd really like to, uh, Denise is saying same for 700 and 1600 buildings. I'm sure it's you know, all the brick buildings, but, you know, I've been to campuses that have older buildings than ours with thicker brick and so on, and they have no problem getting it. So um, uh, just wanted to emphasize that that's a really important one. Yeah, looks like you're getting a lot of support in the chat too, so. <laughs> Georgie, did you have uh, something else? No, I just haven't taken okay. it down. All right. Energy, how about you? So I just wanted to add with Sutter, we do have a, a number of degrees that students are supposed to be able to complete at the Sutter Center without having to come here. But we do have to make sure that we are supporting the students with the student services as well, because it doesn't make sense if they can do their classes there, but then they can't get those services there and they still have to drive here. And I think that was one of the reasons, and I am a local person, I pay also with, you know, the, the bond that we had, um, but I, I believe that's what the community wanted. And when we did have the Sutter Center start out, it did make a big difference, especially with our dual enrollment. Um, students could take classes because they, I live in Live Oak, it takes me about half an hour to get here, you know, and so that makes a big difference for students where it takes them five to 10 minutes. So I, I think we still need to keep that in mind also for working folks. Uh, we have a larger population in Sutter, and so um, I think it's important to keep them in mind and make sure that they can get their degree down there as well as getting those student services. You are um, echoing. So this this idea actually came from the Academic Senate. It's been a focus of theirs for a while. And the um, feedback through kind of a, a series of data points, including the focus groups, was clear that we needed not only to have a strategy, but a discussion about staffing it. So I agree. Thank you, Energy. All right, Jeremy, next slide. Okay, so um, the College Council is going to be reviewing the feedback that we've gotten through the survey, through conversations with their constituencies, taking a look at the draft document and making a recommendation. 
Um, and, you know, again, that's the commitment we're making as an institution that in the next three years, these are the things we're really trying to make change. Um, I've shared on numerous occasions that um, I, I want us to be actionable in these items. And in order to be actionable, we really do have to remain focused. And that means there's going to be things that come up in the next three years that maybe we didn't think about. And we may need to say that, that this isn't the right time for us to do that because we are focused on these outcomes that we committed to as an institution. And I know that's hard, um, but as an institution that is resource constrained, although I have yet to be in an institution that hasn't had some sort of resource constraint, we really wanna put our whole train behind making progress in these areas. Um, so College Council is gonna recommend the final outcomes to us and that will build the foundation of what our EMP is. That's our commitment. Um, in the meantime, we are starting to review our current college mission and putting together our college vision. We're gonna run a parallel process to what we saw happen at the district. There's a small writing team that's meeting to review the college's mission statement and to draft a college vision statement, which is how we did it with the district. That'll get distributed to everyone uh, for feedback. We'll likely use a survey where people can give some um, feedback on what has been drafted. The writing team will get a chance then to review all of that feedback and make a decision on inclusion, making some adjustments, et cetera, and then put forward a uh, mission and vision that'll be included in the EMP. We also, as I mentioned earlier, are working on the sort of the living document behind it. I, I want to be very clear about work plans that this is not uh, this is not something that's going to be included in individual evaluations or anything like that. It's the operational how are we going to get to the outcomes that we uh, have committed to as an institution. So what are we going to focus on first? What are the steps we're going to take? Who's responsible for that so that we can keep that in front of our mind? We identified at the beginning of our EMP process that we one of the steps we missed in our previous EMP was that we didn't have a really good accountability plan so that we actually moved in that direction. And so this is where that accountability comes in. Over the summer, the pictures and the narratives and the letter from the president, et cetera, are going to be drafted. And then in August, we will get a chance as an institution to see the full EMP, which will match our guidelines. It won't be uh, 200 pages like, um, like EMPs have been in many other institutions. It'll be very student focused. Uh, and hopefully we will be ready to move forward and start making it happen. Um, and likely at the September board meeting, um, although uh, potentially at the August board meeting, they also will get a chance to review it. Jeremy, I think I have one more slide. Nope, I don't. Okay. So if you have any additional feedback or you want to have conversations, I'd encourage you at this point to reach out to uh, those individuals who are on the college council and are reviewing the draft outcomes. Uh, we will certainly type up the feedback that we heard today, combine that with what we've already submitted on the survey and look forward to moving that process forward. And with that, now I think I'm turning it over to Annabelle. Um, hello, everyone. And uh, today I have the pleasure of doing the YC Proud uh, Spotlight, which is one of our student workers out in the um, ASYC Campus Life Arena. And this uh, it goes out to Alora. I'm going to say her name wrong and I apologize. Kacharam. Um, she uh, obviously led sidewalk, um, chalk, uh, wayfinding projects and uh, with her art skills that she has. She's an amazing artist. Um, in the spring for the welcome week. She's active uh, source of support and leadership with almost every student. She's very engaged. Uh, if some of you have seen her when you come to the bookstore, she's always out doing things with students. She's very active in campus life. Uh, she's a huge help with the drive through the commencement last year. And she assisted with the Yuba College room building audit and helped develop the spreadsheet for clearly documenting current room setups and needs. She regularly assists with the work in, in the Identity and Engagement Center, including decorating for cultural heritage celebrations and creating graphics, highlights, and student activities. So way to go uh, to Alora. Thank you. All right, way to go, Alora. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I am super excited to also do a YC Proud, hashtag YC Proud Spotlight. 
of one of our newest employees, um, Aspetia goes by AJ Gerardo. Um, AJ started with Yuba College in mid-January 2022. And when I say he hit the ground running, um, that's a direct quote from Dr. O, his new partner in chemistry. Um, he replaced, if you might remember, Susie Corpe after 27 years, so he had big shoes to fill. And, you know, chemistry is very difficult to, to work with with labs. He came in with organic chemistry and just wowed us. Um, give you a little background. Number one, I'm proud to say he's a Yuba College alum. So go 49ers. Um, he's our new lab tech for chemistry. Um, has his chemical engineering degree from UC San Diego. And um, a little sneaky uh, unknown fact you may not know about, given he's new, we worked on a NASA project with UC San Diego. And I love this, recovering chemical resources from lunar ice. So you definitely have to talk to him, come over to the 800 building and ask him about that. And from Casey, AJ was my chem tutor, amazing help to the department. Uh, AJ, um, I'll let you come talk to that one. That's pretty great. But um, Keenan and Associates also did um, a hazardous material inventory. And AJ stepped right up to help us out with getting things lined up in a row, which was an amazing leadership role he took on very soon in his um, start with Yuba College. Um, he will help out with faculty in biology and team up with everyone. He um, took EEO training really soon to step up to help out in search committees when I when I told him that we were having a shortage. He's just a total team player. AJ, do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, Michael, for the kind words. I really appreciate it. Um, maybe a bit overzealous, you know, considering I'm still new here, but uh, hopefully I can fill those big shoes that you mentioned. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. A lot of the credit, honestly, I attribute to um, Sarah Scott, who was my previous colleague in biology and and uh, the temp lab tech for a time, Leticia. They gave me all the necessary tools to, you know, hit the ground running. So I really appreciate it. I really appreciate all my colleagues and the chemistry department and the um, STEM division. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, AJ. We look forward to seeing all the great things to come. And I'm going to turn it back to Annabelle. Cassie, I'm oh, sorry. Cassie, can you do this one? Please? Yeah, hi guys. Um, my name is Casey. I am filling in for Crystal Ferrer for um, the campus life technician position. So I've been here for a couple months now. Um, I just wanted to present on a few things we're doing over here in campus life. So a couple different things. Um, our IEC Center Identity and Engagement Center has been in full swing these last two months. Um, April was Arab American Heritage Month, so we did a couple of events honoring that. And then May is actually Asian Pacific um, Heritage Month, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So we've been having a couple movie screenings. Um, our amazing IEC coordinator, Carlos, who's another student worker, um, is putting on an origami event and a lantern painting event later in the season, or the season, the month. So um, if anyone has any questions about that or would like to attend, we would love to have you. Um, those dates and times are below. Uh, and then that'll kind of close out our IEC Center for the spring semester. Um, I'm working with Carlos on things we can do in the summer. Um, we are aware that it is going to be a little less traffic on campus, but we still want to present um, the center to those students who are here. So um, that info will be coming closer to the end of the semester. So uh, next slide, please. Oh, that is not my slide. <laughs> That is my slide and I am happy and excited to have the arts and education spotlight. Um, I want to start with our ECE program. Um, we're also highlighting them. Um, they will be in the Appeal Democrat. Um, thank you to Katie for putting that together. Um, currently our ECE program has three degrees and 11 certificates uh, starting in the fall of 22. They are courses in child development, um, 
will for the associate teacher certificate of training will be offered completely in Spanish. We've started with a cohort, but all of the courses will be offered starting in the fall. They've transitioned many of their courses to a nine week format, which allows the students to earn multiple certificates within a year. Um, we've also added an elementary teacher education associate, um, as well as a transitional kindergarten certificate to support the expansion of TK in the K-12 system. Um, the faculty have worked to establish a partnership with Sac State to offer a bachelor's in child and adolescent development and education on our Marysville campus. Um, and that leads into the teaching credential program for many of our students. So they've just done an amazing job and they've worked to redo this program the last couple of years. So congratulations to all of our ECE staff. You are absolutely amazing. Other highlights that we have going, um, our wonderful part-time instructors in art are working to put together a, an art show that'll open the week of May 9th in the library. Um, and so they're working to get that together to showcase the work their students are doing and then it'll also be available for the open house. Our tutoring services are alive and well, but we do need your help. And as you come into the finals, please, we do need recommendations for writing tutors and content tutors. Um, our hours in writing alone this semester have almost doubled. And so thank you so much for the support you have given us and the encouragement you've given your students to attend. Um, and last but certainly not least is our music department. Um, they've done some amazing work as well with their students. Their noon recitals are continuing. We have one on May 10th. Um, I believe it is our last noon recital for this semester. So if you're on campus, please stop by. They're doing an evening spring instrumental um, on May 13th. And then we also have another one on May 20th, which is the department extravaganza. Um, and the, I believe the spring instrumental is the jazz um, and the department extravaganza will fe feature our symphonic dance. So thank you to all of the faculty for your wonderful work. Um, I am turning it back over to Annabelle. Can I say something real quick, Christina? Yes, Suzanne. Please. This is Suzanne. I'm so sorry. I haven't sent this flyer out yet, but I wanted to add to Christina's um, highlight that if you could put on your calendars, um, we had a lovely performance of poetry show in April, our speech arts workshop, and our end of the semester show is going to be live on Zoom. In the fall, we'll be back in the classroom doing our shows um, on campus, but our Speech Night Performances of Literature is going to be Thursday, May 19th at 7 p.m. live on Zoom. And students are going to be performing poetry and prose and drama, and you're really going to enjoy it. Um, as I did in April, I'll be sending you the program with the Zoom link. And then I'm also gonna be sending you, you know, a separate Zoom invitation. And you can, you can share them with your students, post them in Canvas, but we would love to have as many of you there as possible. So May 19th, 7 p.m. Zoom. And if I can add one more thing, and I'm gonna put it in the chat so you guys can all see the link. We've had um, just a wonderful turnout on the Padlet, oh. thanking the teachers for all their wonderful work this semester. It is Faculty Appreciation Week. So I'm gonna share that. If you haven't gotten a chance to look at it, please do so. Um, thank you guys all for your wonderful work. Back to my slides again, thanks. <laughs> um, so ASYC uh, is also ending out their year um, with these officers, uh, the 2021-2022 officers, um, and they're actually their final event will be a finals frenzy, similar to I believe what they did last year and for welcome week. So on May 16th and 17th, the week before um, finals, they will be out um, both in the Yuba College Quad by the 300 building, as well as outside the Library Tutoring Center, um, handing out just some goodies, gifts that we can give to students to help prepare them for finals, um, pens, pencils, you name it, snacks, um, waters, all that good stuff to help them feel supported. Um, and then that will close out their, their semester as officers. Um, on May 20th, that will be almost the first day for our new set of officers coming in. Um, we have a lot of, of um, returning 
students and a few new ones. So um, they'll start preparing for the upcoming fall 2022 semester in the summer. So um, we have one, one position that is still being voted on and that's happening currently. That's our vice president role. So we will then have our full set of officers for 2022-2023 um, next week. So uh, next slide on this. And then other things coming up um, on the left hand side, you have a few different events happening in our theater. Um, so I'll have you guys take a look at that. And then we also just yesterday um, had our grad fair for those students graduating this semester. It was an amazing event. Um, the bookstore was here. Uh, we were there out um, providing info to those students. EOPS, um, TRIO were also there. And we actually were able to hand out um, up to 200 caps and gowns to students. So we covered the charge for that. And um, David, my friend at the bookstore said that almost everyone was completely surprised that that was happening, um, something they were really grateful for. And I'm glad we were able to present that to students. Um, so we're going to also have a little impromptu kind of secondary grad fair at um, Open House, um, just so students again can try on caps and gowns, see how they're fitting and then also we can provide information that they need um, if they do show up. So uh, next slide on that. Passing it to somebody else. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. So hi, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Hang in there. We're almost done, kind of. <laughs> so basically, um, my name is Liliana Becerra, Lily for short. And we're still taking applications for MESA. Um, we're open now, so if you can send students over, the center is open, I am there, or my student worker, so send them over if you have any questions, anybody that's in a STEM major, send them over, and we can totally work with them. I know I'm at the side of the campus in room 701, but it's a nice walk down here, so by all means, come over, um, let them know about MESA. MESA provides different things. Uh, we're hoping in the fall to do campus tours do um, some more conferences, workshops. Uh, we are providing internship and research opportunities. We do have the scholarship for MESA that's $250 through the uh, YC Foundation application. So that's something that I didn't know and students didn't know. So please uh, spread the word. And um, to be eligible, they, the students need to not have a, a bachelor's. They, wanna, they intend to go to a four-year institution, be eligible or receiving financial aid, be a, for a first generation student and be taking one of the STEM major courses that require calculus. If you don't know if they are or not, just send them over and I will still meet with them. And I've also put on here some of the majors, but um, yeah, students can apply online or in person. I think I've had a couple of students bring a buddy. And so I thought that was exciting today where I had two different set of students that brought a buddy and they so far, we're all eligible. So that's been exciting to see that happen. So yeah, just letting you know that I'm still taking applications. Please, please spread the word. <laughs> Thank you. And I think Chris is next. Thank you. Um, in the month of April, we were able to help our high school seniors and we had uh, several registration dates available for them where they received some really direct counseling. So we were able to help almost 200 high school seniors from, from our local area. Next slide, please. So I wanted to welcome um, Maria Ramirez. She is the new administrative secretary in the counseling department. We stole her from East Nicholas High School. We're so grateful that she is working for us and she is fitting right in. Next slide, please. We want to welcome Ann Welty back. Ann Welty uh, started as a part-time counselor in the EOPS program, then transitioned to EOPS. She has an enormous background, and we are so excited to have her back. Um, she's only working a couple of days each month, but hopefully by fall, she will increase her hours, and we are so excited to have Ann um, with us. And I'll turn the, slot, the time over to Jennifer. Hi everyone, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that we are having our YC Welcomes You open house. It's a week from this Saturday, so about a week and a half from now. Um, if you are interested in participating and you did not sign up, the form is closed, but you can reach out directly to me. I will be sending out an email for everybody who has contacted us for, to participate 
early next week. So stay tuned for that and it will have details about um, what's going on. We have t-shirts for everyone. It should be a great time. Encourage students, your friends, your family to come out um, May 14th. Thank you. Oh, I'm gonna hand it over to Marcy Lane. Hi everyone, we're running out of time. So I'm gonna just make this very um, short. Um, DSPS wants to thank you all. Um, for the support you provided for students with disabilities this spring. Um, it takes a collaborative effort and, um, and a village, and we thank you for your part in that. Um, and then as the semester comes to a close, we know that faculty are gonna be focusing on um, preparing your syllabi for summer and for fall. And so we don't wanna miss the opportunity to remind you um, of the value of including a disability statement in your syllabus. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of this. I will post um, a link to some disability statement suggestions in the chat. Um, and if you want to have a conversation about it or you want to um, get more information, you can um, email me directly. So I will now pass it to Christoph Knopfsinger. And for the sake of time, I don't, I made sure I didn't have anything to uh, report. So I'll pass it on to I believe bookstore. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Like Casey said, we just completed our grad fair and it, it was um, a super success. I mean, um, we helped a ton of students. A lot of a lot of students were so surprised when they came up to the register ready to pay. And we told them, hey, the campus is covering everything for you. Um, you know, it, it was it was awesome to see. And it, that, that's the kind of memories. Um, that we want to create with the students. Um, we have uh, the tassels that uh, were short shipped and Perf Jones is having some issues with uh, staffing. Uh, they're still uh, feeling the woes of the pandemic. So uh, we were able to partner with UC Merced um, and they are going to provide us um, 500 of the uh, tassels with the uh, 2022 on there. So um, I spoke to the manager today and he should be sending them over. So um, I'm hoping by Friday, no later than Monday, we will have all those tassels for the students that didn't get their tassels um, and we will be ready to go. We've got 500 more caps and gowns coming in from Herf Jones and hopefully uh, we've given them enough time. We shouldn't see any delays in that. All the faculty uh, rental regalia should be here on the 16th. So you know, cross your fingers. Hopefully um, everything is showing up on time. Uh, we did give them the 25 day lead time uh, to make sure that everybody has what they need. Um, so, you know, we're, we're doing what we have to do to make sure that the students um, have what they need for the ceremony. And, and you know, there's no uh, speed bumps along the way. So um, on a good note, um, food, Coffee and tea will, is uh, the food is back in the in the bookstore. So we have uh, been able to get more refrigerated food. We have a microwave out. Uh, Friday we do have a Keurig um, coffee machine being delivered by Alhambra. So we are going to offer the K cups again, uh, a wide variety of the teas. Um, we are bringing in the local coffee company, um, Bridge Street Coffee Company. So they are going to be added as. Um, vendors. Um, so we will be um, selling the tea, uh, cups of tea for 99 cents and a cup of coffee for $1.49. So please support the bookstore. Um, and uh, summer 22 um, adoptions are pretty much here now. Uh, we are 60% of the way um, with all the adoptions. So a huge thank you for all the uh, instructors that have gotten us all the information that we need. Um, and please, even though you are not using any uh, course materials, we still need to know. Every single semester, uh, we wipe the slate clean. We start over. We don't know who is using the same stuff. I haven't been here long enough. Sarah hasn't been here long enough. So even if you're not using any course materials, we still need to know because we have to enter all that information into the computer. Um, we are 10% of the way there with the fall. So thank you again for all the instructors that have gotten us all the information. Um, you know, all this is about student success and all this does is just help the students succeed. Um, you know, with Herf Jones, we're seeing that there's still issues with the pandemic. Um, we've already had a lot of the uh, publishers, um, they're calling us with information for fall. They want to know what books we're going to be using for fall because they're planning ahead and they want to make sure that 
we have, they have all the books for us. Um, and the one thing that we can't do, the one thing that we did for uh, spring is, um, you know, we got a lot of late, late information. So, you know, when you submit late information, you can't expect to get what you need. I mean, we're not the only school in the country that's, that is going back to school. Everybody else is, is going to the same people to get their course materials. So we need to make sure that we give them enough time so that we get the books that we need. And preferably, we'd like to have used books. Used books is more of a value to our students. So, um, you know, when we have to go out and get the new books, it, it, it costs the students more money and books are getting more and more expensive. So uh, we want to make sure that we're giving the students a chance to, to have the course materials uh, and give them the best possible experience and set them up to succeed. Um, and that starts with us. Um, you're going to hear this from me every single semester. Uh, I, my role in this partnership is to be the bad guy. And I have to pound at your door and I have to, you know, try to get the information any way that I possibly can. Um, and we don't want to, we don't want to chase away the students. You know, we want to make sure that uh, we give them uh, positive experiences and, you know, positive experiences produce positive results. Um, and one thing that I've always learned uh, in all the years that I've managed businesses is if we don't take care of our customers, somebody else is going to take care of them for us. And they're our greatest source of advertising. You know, we, um, we can do everything right, but if we don't have the books for them, you know, sometimes that's all it takes. And in this day and age with social media, um, you know, one bad experience means they put it on social media, they can tell the whole world. So we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we have everything that we need when they need it. Um, and if everybody does what they're supposed to do, uh, we should be able to um, take care of all our students um, every single semester. So um, thank you for all the support. And that's all I have. And I'll turn it over to uh, the cafeteria. I don't I think don't. That we have Audrey here today, but um, I think we do have Sonia here. Hi, everybody. I'm Sonia Lawland. It's wonderful to be here and hear about all the amaz amazing things and work you're doing. So I am here to give a very, very quick update on a the DC3 of uh, the District Consultation Council uh, a task force that has been working on a report uh, as requested by the Chancellor uh, as follow up to the FICMAT report. So if that's all Greek to you, I will explain. I have a lot of slides, but I'm gonna go very quickly. So next slide, please. So kind of just some background. Um, we've seen, as you're, I'm sure you're aware, for a number of years, declining enrollment. Because of that declining enrollment, which was accelerated due to COVID, um, the Board of Trustees Finance Committee asked uh, the Fiscal Crisis and Management Team, FICMAT, to come in and conduct a study to take a look at the district cost structure and um, give feedback on how we might improve our fiscal position. So the, that report was presented by FICMAT to the board uh, last fall and it made recommendations in eight, eight areas. And so um, increasing enrollment, improving classroom efficiency, addressing total cost of operations, and they suggested we identify other reductions. Next slide, please. Um, so in response to that report in October, um, that report's been shared broadly. I'm, I'm hoping you've all had a chance to review it. Um, a couple of surveys were done. The colleges and district survey, uh, district services created reports, and all of that came to this DC3 working group, which was formed in January uh, to with this purpose statement. And um, the this group was directed to create a report uh, for the chancellor that identifies specific strategies for resource reallocation to to address that ongoing structural uh, issue. Um, and uh, that would serve our students in an equitable way and lead to uh, sustainable high quality operations. So that was the charge of this working group. Uh, next slide, please. And it was a, it's a great team. I'm calling it the dream team. I mean, this group has been amazing and worked really, really hard. I see Jeremy here and I know Cassie's here. Um, so there's a ton of folks from Yuba College, the district office and, and Woodland who participated and worked really hard uh, over the last few months. Um, the group created guiding principles, um, so, so we really uh, followed these guiding principles. I won't read them because I know we're tight on time. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then we broke into these four areas and these groups uh, really drilled down into these four areas that FICMAT had asked us to create recommendations for. So you'll see FTES growth and student issues, team two, classroom efficiency and FON, uh, team three, total cost of operations and team four, other reductions. So these smaller working groups drilled down, looked at data, met with people um, and spent a ton of time on these specific areas. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is just an example of the time commitment. These were our large group meetings. And in addition, there were all the small group meetings. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who's participated on this team, these teams. It, it was a lot of work and time. Um, we created a template to put the recommendations on. You can see um, each recommendation had a title, um, the narrative, uh, metrics for monitoring progress, and then also implementation challenges or 10 plus ones, or if it had to be negotiated, there's another box that's not on here. Um, then fiscal services went on and identified an estimated uh, benefit, savings, or a cost to, to implement uh, this, this, re this recommendation. So for every recommendation in the report, you'll see a template like this for that with that information. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that, so the, the four groups were working on all these recommendations and then all of the recommendations came to the larger group and we met and went through every recommendation and had answered questions, drilled down on them. And then we recorded the level of support for the large group uh, for each recommendation. So you would vote for either fully support, support with reservations or do not support. And for any with reservations or do not support, we captured all of the feedback. So that's in this report for every recommendation. So this is an example, you'll see this in the report, but for this recommendation, we had eight folks who fully supported it, two with reservations, um, none with do not support, and two people were missing that day. But then we captured all the comments and feedback from the, the uh, folks that had reservations. So all that's in the report, so you can read it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also um, came up with an evaluation criteria. So we used this lens as we were evaluating those. Um, and we also had some other considerations we were using as well. So just as an FYI. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm going so fast. So in total, we had 24 recommendations that are in this report. You'll see a chart in this report like this. If you click on the link, it'll take you right to the template and you'll have all the information about it. And then you'll see the level of support category. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but there's 24 for your reading pleasure. Um, and so this is just an example of that chart. So you'll see that chart in the body of the document. A next slide. Um, these are the next steps that we've identified. Um, the draft was presented yesterday to DC3. Uh, DC3 has um, until Friday to, to give feedback to the writing team group, and that will all be consolidated and go to the writing team. The report will be finalized then after that. Um, then it goes to the chancellor uh, for his review and consideration, and then the chancellor will be, you know, uh, prioritizing the recommendations or maybe adding some additional ones. Um, then he'll come back and circle back to the working group uh, later in May and give us an update. And then uh, our group is recommending that after that happens, an implementation plan uh, be created by Chancellor's Cabinet. Uh, and, and that would be June, July-ish. Um, we're also going to be taking this report as information to the policy and finance committees of the Board of Trustees, and the Chancellor will be taking his, his recommendations. Um, the group feels like it's really critical, critical to monitor progress, and so we want DC3 to take that on and, and monitor that progress. So those are the next steps. So uh, final slide. This is where you can find the report. So it's posted. Um, on our, our uh, district webpage. So if you if you go to central services and click on that and go to education and planning and then planning documents, you'll see it. Uh, it's the third document at the bottom. And don't, when you see the file, it's gigantic. The report itself is like 13 pages. It's the attachments that are so crazy, crazy. So it's only 13 pages and I really encourage y'all to, to read it. Um, and, and thank you again to the everyone who's worked uh, on this. It was a heavy lift and we were under an incredibly tight timeline. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So that's it for me, uh, it, unless there's any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lallan. Um, so we don't have anyone, I believe, from IT or MNO. 
Um, so yes, we're open for questions. It is after five o'clock. So thank you for staying longer. Um, I, I have a quick one. Do you, do you know when dual enrollment contracts are going to the high school that we make with the high schools are going before the board for their approval for Paul? So Greg, are you talking about like CCAP agreements that might need to be updated or? Yep. yep. June, the June board meeting. Okay. We can offer that if there's anyone with questions, please stay on, we'll be here to answer them. And if not, it was great to see you all. Thanks for being here. Have an awesome night. As everyone's transitioning, those of us that normally stay, suggestions for improvement, we probably need to, it was a, it was a big agenda this time. We probably won't be able to have, a, we usually don't have a meeting in June and July because there's just too much, uh, too many people gone. Um, so I think we tried to get everything done as quickly as we could. Thanks, Sonia, have a good day. Um, but certainly controlling the agenda. All right, well, thanks for being here and contributing. It was good to see you all.